My full name is Paige Bolivar Sawyer III. I was born in Aiken, South Carolina, March 21st, 1948. My parents, Paige B. Sawyer Jr. was my father. My mother, Gloria Reardon Sawyer, was my, my mother. Uh, Christine Sawyer Kirkley is my older sister, and Deborah Elizabeth Sawyer Pepin is my younger sister. And Christine is 14 months older than I am, and Debbie is 15 months younger than I am. So my mother had three stair, step, stair steps all close together. I grew up in, my childhood years were in Columbia, South Carolina. Then my family moved to Charleston in 1960. My high school years were in Charleston. Then my family moved to Bishopville in 1965. I finished high school there. I went to radio broadcasting school after high school, and I was applying, I had applied to Carolina to go there, but the draft was very prominent in 1968, and I joined the Army before I could get enrolled into Carolina for their fall semester. Basic training was at Fort Jackson outside Columbia. And then AIT, which followed basic training, was at Fort Devens, Massachusetts. And then after Fort Devens, um, I've forgotten how many in the class, we were sent to Vietnam. Okay. And when did you go to Vietnam? You Went to Vietnam in March of 1969 and stayed for one year. We came home in March of 1970. I uh, went to Fort Devens in Kansas at that time. A friend of mine, he and I were in Vietnam together. We had already planned to put in a transfer to go back to Vietnam. So we went back to Vietnam in July of 1970 and stayed until October of 1971, where we were both uh, given a five-month early out. So we got out in October of 1971. Well, it's sort of, when I went to talk to the recruiter about joining the Army, he said the Army Security Agency was a very top secret organization and the Army's military branch of the National Security Associ Agency. And if you were intelligent enough to get into the ASA, the Army Security Agency, the ASA wasn't in Vietnam, but it was a four-year commitment. So you had to pass all the tests and commit a four-year part of your life to the military. Well, I passed, and I joined the Army Security Agency. And true, it wasn't in Vietnam, but it was undercover in Vietnam because it was a top-secret agency, and it went by the name Radio Research. And the Radio Research was all over Vietnam. So... We didn't know that at the time when we joined the military, but once we got into the military and found out more about the ASA, you know, the recruiter, he collected a nice little bonus because he enlisted somebody for four years instead of three years, and hey, we accepted it. And the Army Security Agency, it was top secret. We had a top secret crypto uh, clearance. We weren't in the jungles fighting Charlie. You know, we were susceptible to all the dangers that were in Vietnam, firefights and mortars and rockets and everything like that, but we were not going through the jungle, you know, looking for Charlie. We, the 101st Radio Research Company, which I was in, we had four platoons. We, Vietnam was divided into four different sections. You had I-Corps, II-Corps, III-Corps, and IV-Corps. So the 101st Radio Research Company had a platoon in each of those corps. And the platoon was made up of 25 to 30 people. So it was, it was a small unit, but every month, for about three weeks out of that month, we would go to a combat unit, a um, different types of units that were supplying aid to the South Vietnamese, our... our um, 
our people we were fighting for. So we would go and monitor security, tele telecommunications, and telephone conversations, and we were listening for security leaks. So that's what we did. So we would go out three weeks out of the month to different areas throughout Vietnam, and then we would come back for a week and regroup and then go out again. So that was one good thing about being with the 101st Radio Research Company. We got to see a lot of Vietnam. And if you were stationed with, with some of the other radio research units, you stayed in one place the entire time, and you never got off that compound or that base. But we were blessed in that respect. So I got to see quite a bit of Vietnam. I got to fly in various aircraft, fixed wing or helicopters. You know, we were all over. We, I'll have to show you the travel orders that we had because they were, <laughs> gave us unlimited access to just about any plane or any form of transportation and to any destination. And we could also fly in civilian clothes if needed. But we were in uniform and, you know, we didn't. We did what we were supposed to. Well, yeah, I remember all the places where we were, where we went. I remember um, a special forces camp we went to at Tay Ninh, and it was right below a, what they call the big mountain, Nui Ba Dinh, and I've forgotten what that, the Black Virgin, I think that means Black Virgin in Vietnam, Vietnamese. And the mountain yards, the native people of Vietnam, the special forces used them as their partners. And we got to know some of the uh, mountain yards, which was a French word. It was, you know, slang for, I've forgotten how to spell it, but it was mountain yards. But we um, got to know them, and they were good soldiers. The Vietnamese people castigated the mountain yards because they lived in the country part of Vietnam, and they were sort of like the Indians here in America. You know, they were respected for their hunting skills, for their fighting skills, for their ferociousness, but they were not liked by the Vietnamese because they were not part of that ethnic group. <laughs> yeah, when I was in the train, and I stayed in the train, longer than any other place, we had a boat. And it was like a big John boat. It was probably 22, 24 feet long. And we traded, when you're in the army, in the military, you scrounge and you trade things. So we traded two sundry, sundry, sundry packs, which had cigarettes and sea rations and candy. We traded those to some Vietnamese engineers who had a boat on their compound. So we, got the boat, we traded two air conditioners for two motors to the, to the Coast Guard, and the wives of some of the soldiers who were married, they sent over their fishing reels, fishing rods, and I don't know who, somebody had a pair of skis. Where they came from, I don't know. But on Sunday afternoons, we would take the boat, we had, a, we had to get the Air Force to build a trailer, and we finagled the Air Force, they had a trailer that they hauled fire extinguishers out on the flight line. And we talked, I think we gave him a bottle of whiskey. <laughs> and he made us a trailer that we could put the boat on. And on Sunday afternoons, we would get a foot locker and get a poncho, put the poncho in the foot locker, go downtown to Natrang to a place that sold ice and buy a block of ice. And we'd put our beer and soft drinks in that cooler and then put it in the water. And that was our Sunday afternoon relaxation. And we were very fortunate with that because we enjoyed it. We would go out, then the officers would take it one day. And, you know, that was, to me, that's the height of recreation in Vietnam that you ordinarily would not have. No, there were scary times, you know, when the mortars and the rockets were coming in. One time we were on a convoy going from Nha Trang to uh, Quinyon, I believe, and we uh, took some bullets, some uh, snipers, they were firing at the convoy, and we had to pull into a North Korean compound. The North Koreans, they were over there with us, helping us fight the communists, 
And we went in there and observed the trucks and several had bullet holes in them. Luckily, nobody had been uh, hit. And then where we were also in the Trang, our base camp, where the platoon was, there were mountains all around us. And there were Vietnamese, Charlie, in the mountains. And you could see the Air Force fact planes, the forward air, forward air controllers. They would fly, it's a slow flying Piper Cub. And they would fly in, they would spot where the Vietnamese were. They would shoot a smoke bomb down to, to the area. Then these jets would come by and bomb where the smoke was. And we could watch that. We would get on the roof of our barracks and film that and watch it. And you know, like watching the war right there a half mile away. So that was entertaining, but at the same time, you know, we would go on high alert, have to put on our helmets and flak jackets and get our weapons and stand guard over the barracks in case something happened. Oh yeah, yeah, my two sisters and my parents, they both wrote me, I wrote them. Plus I had other buddies in the military and friends here back home and we would write each other. And um, I would get mad with one guy, he was in the Air Force, he was stationed in Japan. And I kept a little book with everybody's address in it. He would always send me a letter, but he wouldn't put his return address on his envelope. And I would have to go into the book and look it up when I wrote him. So I told him, dadgummit, put your return address on there so I don't have to dig out the address book. So he never did. He did it for spite. But a lot of, I never did, but a lot of the people I served with, Cassette tapes were coming into vogue in the late 60s, early 70s, and they kept in touch with their parents and their families with the cassette tapes. One guy we served with, I felt sorry for him. We would have mail call and everybody, you know, were real happy when they got something, a letter or care package or something. But this guy, he was married and unfortunately got a Dear John letter, so. No, I wasn't sure. Um, I know I wanted to get rid of my GI haircut, and I didn't have long hair, but I wanted, to, I wanted to fit in. You have to keep in mind that even though you were in the military, we were not looked upon as military of, of previous generations. And everybody, when you, when you got out, you wanted to fit in with society at that time. And, um, we, and they told us when we got back to California, you know, be prepared because you're going to have protesters in the airports, you're going to have people around who will not appreciate your service or your uniform. So, um, you know, once we got out, and I remember flying back from California to Columbia in my uniform, and thankfully, you know, you had some stairs, but nothing, no outward violence or anything, but there were a lot of people who were not that fortunate. When I got back to uh, home, I wasn't sure exactly if I was going back to school. I'd gotten into photography when I was in Vietnam and I bought a lot of camera equipment. I bought some darkroom equipment and I wanted to pursue photography. But at the same time, I had this writing uh, instinct that I wanted to do some journalism also. So um, I played around with photography and it won out. And then in, um, I went to work for the Georgetown Times. I did photography and some um, advertising for them. And at the same time, my wife and I, we were married in April of 1974. I'd worked at the Georgetown Times for a year at that time. And a month or so after we got married, we opened a part-time photography business. My wife, Susan, she was working at First Citizens Bank I was working at the Times and doing photography on the side, and she and I were doing photographing weddings on the weekends. So that really got our business going, and in 1976, I left the Georgetown Times and started photography full-time, and in 1978, Susan left her job at the bank, and we went in, it, went in together at that time and established Paige Sawyer Photography, and we've been there ever since. The photography business today is not what it was 25, 30, 40 years ago. So uh, Susan, she works part-time at the 
Georgetown County Chamber of Commerce Visitor Center. I work also as a naturalist on low country tours and I have a walking tour business also. So we love promoting the history of this area. It wasn't like it is today. It was, uh, I mean, it was, had the history, it had the charm and everything. The people were great. The history was here, but the front street was very run down. Um, we had, <laughs> we had a photography business when we first opened. It was above Dr. Johnny Joseph's office at 632 Front Street, right across from the town clock. And it was upstairs and people, you know, they would complain about the stairs. So and at the time, that was all we could afford. In fact, that was the only building that we could afford. But in 1976, a place down at 717 Front Street, where the fire was, it opened up. It was a silver dollar saloon, and it closed. And we moved into there. We had to get the beer smell out. The, you go in the men's bathroom, or the only bathroom they had in the sink, you know, it was bolted to the wall, but it had two pool cues holding up the front. <laughs> so we had to, you know, modernize the bathroom, and, and we stayed there until 1979, and we added on to our home at that time, and the studio, the photography studio has been there ever since. But Front Street was very different, you know, 50 years ago than what it was, to, what it is today. The street, the utility poles with the street lamps, the wires, the businesses on Front Street were mainly finance offices, and um, you had Thomas's Cafe, and you had a lunch counter in Roses, and I believe those were the only restaurants on Front Street at that time. But Front Street was not the charm and the tourist draw then that it is now. Yeah, thankfully I'm a seventh generation South Carolinian and I've done genealogy on my family and I have relatives who fought in the American Revolutionary War. I have rel relatives who fought in the war between the states. I have relatives who fought in World War I, World War II. I don't think I have any who fought in the Korean War. Um, I was participated in the Vietnam War our two sons, they're both Citadel graduates, and one is a re retired Air Force. So, you know, military runs strong through our family. Susan, my wife, her father was a retired uh, Navy. She has a nephew who's in the Army. She had a nephew who was in the Marine Corps. She had a brother who was in the Navy. So, you know, we're a military family, and um, we thank those who came before us who served we thank those who are serving now. And, um, you know, only about 1% of the population in America today is in the military. So we thank them for volunteering. I'm a member of the American Legion, the VFW, um, the, and I'm active in both. Anything that has to do with promoting the military and patriotism, I believe in.